Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, where you walk through the October evening and hold close to things you want to save for memories. Then Broadway's as innocent and nostalgic as music drifting from a carousel. If you move on, you get hit in the face by a guy fishing for nickels under a grating. Whatever you were pursuing is gone now, lost. And Broadway trails off into the side streets. Walk them, like I did. And try to close your eyes against the pattern of scars in the street of the tenement. The kids with the torn deck of cards under the lamppost. The dogs at the trash can. The wide-eyed girl who lurched against me. Pardon. That's all right. The spectacular simper. The neon winks. You pick through the litter of darkness and you buy. Because on Broadway, there's nothing else. And at the edge of Broadway, about where it touches the morning, the night has been in partnership with death. Their place of business, the Kreblin Mortuary. A man is polishing a brass sign on his marble facade. He moves to consider his work. You see that the sign reads... Easy payments, inquire within. And within there's the scent of cut flowers and another man who leans against a marble pillar. His brow is lighted with a pink spotlight discreetly hidden in the foliage of a potted palm. And he inhales the faint music of an electric organ. He sees you, firmly detaches himself from his reverie, and attaches himself to you with a moist hand. In this hour of your grief, in this hour of your loneliness, we are here but to lead you through the maze. Someone called. They said that... Please, please, I understand. You have been recommended to us. You will not find us wanting. You didn't let me finish. They said a man was dead here. Naturally. We are dedicated they to... They said he was murdered. Oh. Oh, that. Then you must be of the police. Welcome. Where is he? Just sitting there in the Queen Victoria Chapel with a knife in the back of his throat. The reason I noticed him is that he remained after the funeral services of Agnes Harper. I am Emmerich Cleveland, so proprietor, and I... Take me to the Queen Victoria Chapel. Of course. You love it. It is the chapel we reserve for ladies of lavender-like dignity, such as Miss Agnes Harper, deceased. It suits their essence to the idea. Observe. Who was he? I meant you to observe the Victorian elegance of this room, the exquisite Victorian vows in which are the ashes of Agnes Harper. This man, who was he? When the others filed out, this man remained, so I quickly took the liberty of removing whatever bits and pieces of identity he had on him. Give them to me. Here, take them. You would see all he adds up to, from his driver's license, etc., is someone called John Webster of 1976 Laden Place, New Rochelle. I've been to New Rochelle. He came here alone? I couldn't possibly know. I was so engrossed arranging things, I couldn't possibly know. The others who attended the services, would you know that? Of course I would. I have each guest sign our guest book as they enter. It's one of our more delicately thoughtful services. It also supplies us with a gratuitous mailing list. We must be on our toes in this profession. Here. This uh, page, all these were guests? All of them. Uh, quite a catch, wouldn't you say? I'll take it. Please. How dare you tear the page from the book. Those people were about to receive our most recent literature on the... I've list. deprived them of it. Can you ever forgive me, Mr. Kravlin? <laughs> there wasn't much more after that. The boys from Technical came, and Mr. Crevelin watched their manner of considering death with professional jealousy. Mr. Crevelin took it out on me. He measured me with his eyes, handed me a brochure, and smiled sadly. I left. I called headquarters and told them to find out what they could on a man named John Webster. Then the consideration of the page torn out of the guest book. The names written down by Polipo to furnish proof positive that they had come only to witness the funeral, not to contribute themselves to it. First name, Ethel Harper, family, it said. Address, Summerfield Apartments on Madison Avenue. Go there. Ride up to the seventh floor on a noiseless elevator. Walk down the carpeted hallway. Rap on the panel door. Have you brought flowers? My sister is dead, you see. People have been bringing flowers. I'm from the police. My name is Danny Clover. And I've been telling them to deliver the flowers to the mortuary. May I come in? Come in? Yes, I'm from the police. I've never talked to a policeman before. Isn't that strange? 
soon as you said you were a policeman, I remembered that. Never in my whole life have I done what I'm doing now. Yes, please, come in. It's about a man named John Webster. In the kitchen, dear. I'll show you. Mm-hmm. In here. My sister loves this kitchen so much. Here. Right from this window. What? My sister jumps right from this window. Everybody who comes here wants to see what window Agnes jumped from. Your sister was a suicide? Don't say that about her. My sister was really not to live. I see. Now, perhaps you can tell me about a man named John Webster. My sister was a woman who loved a man. She died for it. That's a woman's right. What man? My sister loved Thomas Perry. Truly loved him. Thomas Perry? You know him? No, but... Agnes knew him. She loved him. She was a child about love. The way a woman should be. What about a man named John Webster? John Webster? Oh, of course. Of course what? You have the wrong address. I never heard of a man by that name. But she had heard of a man named Thomas Perry. A man her sister truly loved, she said. A man her sister had died for. Also a man whose name was on the funeral list. Address West 51st, a brownstone building converted to offices. A staircase with chipped white enamel signs on each stair asking chipped personal questions. Lonely, stair questions. Friendless, the next stand. In search of true happiness, probe the next. And at the landing, the answer to all the questions. Consult Thomas Perry. Please follow Arrow. The Arrow leads you into a dismal room hung with Japanese lanterns and twisted crepe, arrayed with a three-piece orchestra in shirt sleeves, clotted with somber couples dancing to its respectable rhythms. You tap a dancer on the shoulder and ask for Thomas Perry. She giggles and points him out. He's the man on the platform presiding over it all. I saw you ask Mrs. Gilbert to point me out. <laughs> you don't need to ask permission. Just find a partner and join the fun. You're Thomas Perry? You already know that. And you? Danny Clover, police. Well, I wouldn't think you fellows ever got in this condition. I want to talk to you. A talk? Somewhere quiet. Oh, this is quiet. Besides, I can't leave my people. They'd be lost without me here to stir up things. Uh, what do we talk about, Danny? Agnes Harper. Oh. She loved me. Loved me truly. Pale hands I love beside the Shalimar. A dawning, that kind of love. She killed herself for it. Oh, she shouldn't have done that. She should have known the kind of man I am. What kind is that? <laughs> I'm a businessman, Danny. Agnes came to us in search of happiness. I saw the sign. We sent her various sizes and shapes of hand-sorted happiness. Good, steady, respectable male counterparts. I chose them for her myself. But they didn't do. You took over. <laughs> You're quick, Danny. I took over personally. Agnes was dignity personified. Aristocracy personified. $50,000 personified. And I jilted her. That makes you a businessman? It makes me a dolt. A jerk to you. Oh, Agnes just wasn't for me, that's all. I prefer something gayer. Uh, younger, you know? Yeah, Thomas. Did Agnes ever say anything to you about a man named John Webster? The name John Webster never destroyed anything between Agnes and me. Should it have, Danny? He was murdered at her funeral. Uh, he chose the most appropriate setting, this John Webster. Uh, anything else, Danny? Mrs. Gilbert is beckoning. She wants my arms around her. <laughs> so this uh, list of the people who attended Agnes's funeral. Do you know them? Uh, let me see. And this I know. Mm -hmm. And this. And this. Mm -hmm. And this, all members of my club, all clients, all ladies and gentlemen Agnes met at my tea dances. We make it a point to return courtesies rendered. The others? Utter strangers. And now, if you please, Mrs. Gilbert is really biting her lips. Back to routine. Stop at headquarters and find out that the background of John Webster was still being checked. Leave with Detective Muggerman the names of the members of the Lonely Hearts Club who had attended the funeral. Then more legwork with the rest of the list. And another name, Rose Livingston, West 58th Street. And Mrs. Livingston is happy you dropped in. Yes, I like a man in my parlor, Miss Clover. I'm glad. A man in my parlor with a teacup on his knees, a picture for an artist, in my opinion. 
Now we can talk about the funeral, huh, Miss Livingston? Yes, it started when Mr. Livingston passed on. What started when Mr. Livingston passed on? The bug bit me. Huh? I was sitting there at the services, and suddenly I said to myself, My, my, how nice. How restful. And I've been doing it ever since. Mrs. Livingston, Every I... morning I read the obituary. Pick up the nicest one, in my opinion. And I go. You'd be surprised how many of us... Mrs. Livingston. Oh, Martin. This morning you attended... Agnes a... Harper. I wept. But then I always weep. Just a little, you know. This past, how easy it gets after a while. There was a man there, Mrs. Livingston. A man named John Webster. Did you... Who? John Webster. He was wearing a dark blue suit. He was bald. He was wearing eyeglasses. He had a small mustache. Did you notice him? I knew. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I always give my undivided attention to what's going on up front. I didn't notice a bald-headed man. <laughs> Why should I? More tea, Miss Clover? Hi, old Danny. Oh, hello, Gino. Come on in. I was just wondering, Danny. Hmm? Tonight, Mrs. Tartaglia is dishing up chicken cacciatore, pizza, and generous servings of spumoni, all to be topped off with the performance of the new Cory dishwasher, which I have purchased for her. Uh, care to join us? Oh, thanks, Gino, but I can't. Uh, work, huh? Work. Well, then let's get with it, Danny. Item to it. We have cracked down information on John Webster, deceased. Very uninteresting. No friends, no enemies. She was a divorcee, having at once upon a time been married to one Elizabeth Webster. Now, we'll want to talk to her. At this very moment, she is being looked for, Danny. Good. Then what else? Detective Muggerman has made a check of the people off the list who were members of the Lonely Hearts Club. And what did they find out? Nothing. Except they all want to get married. It's the phone, Danny. Pardon me. Don't mention it. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. Please. Please come quickly to me. Who is this? Ethel Harper. You know my sister is dead. I don't want to be dead. Please. What's the matter with you? There's a man. I've seen him before. He looks at me all the time when I look out of the window from the building across the court. All the time. Please. I'll be right down, Miss Harper. It took ten minutes to get there. On the way, the thought that intruded. Miss Harper was imagining things. The man she saw was part of the hysteria of a mind that somehow I felt was no stranger to hysteria. And up the elevator. Down the hall. Miss Harper. Miss Harper. It's Danny Clover. Miss Harper. The door was open. I went in. Living room, empty. Bedroom, empty. Kitchen, not empty. Miss Harper was there. Miss Harper with a rope around her throat. Miss Harper strung from a ceiling light fixture. And beneath her, space. The fluorescence of the light gleamed on a knife blade on the tabletop. I picked it up, grabbed the kitchen stool and stood on it, and cut Miss Harper down. Breathing fitfully. As if life, then death, held her close for a brief second, then deferred to the other. Then color returned. And her eyes came alive. And they flitted over my face, not understanding, begging, bewildered. All at once, understanding. He tried to kill me. He hung me. He tried to kill me. There's a thing about Broadway. It offers a bag full of free illusions. Every color, every size. Guaranteed against fading. Also a warranty against shrinkage. Just reach in the bag. There's more where that one came from. Consider, for instance, the one that says Broadway can break its heart. Or, for example, the classy all-plastic fall 1950 laboratory-tested one that says Broadway can shed a tear. That's the one for a man who is murdered in a mortuary. Only who weeps? Who sheds a tear? The current sound, the one I was most familiar with at the moment, was offered by a woman, Ethel Harper, lately cut down from a noose. I'm feeling much better now, Mr. Clover. The doctor should be here soon. <laughs> right now, the important thing for you to oh, do is... Oh, I to... said I felt all right. I don't need a doctor. What did you call a doctor for? Because you were almost dead. Oh, people think of 
dying, Mr. Clover. But the hand... You think you can tell me what happened? Oh, the things that happened. Everything so fast. Where one thing stopped and the other began. Let me help. You saw a man looking at you across the court from a window. Which window? Yes. Yes, that's right. From that window, directly across. Then you called me. Then? Then, well, I don't know. It seemed right after that he walked in. The man from the window? Yes. All I can remember him that his suit was rough material. I feel it now against my cheek right here, right here, Mr. Clover. All right. Go ahead. I don't know. Did you fight with him? I don't know. Do you remember screaming? I don't know. Did he ask you for money? Did, did he ask you for anything? I don't know. He was big. And his suit was rough. Did he talk to you first? Did he just come in? And... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. If my sister were here, you wouldn't do this. I'm sorry. It wouldn't have happened if Agnes were here. Take it easy, Oh, you didn't know Agnes, did you? No. My sister, Agnes. She's dead, you know. She turned her back to me, arranged the folds of the freshly laundered lace curtains on the window her sister had jumped from, shook her head slowly, rearranged them, then turned back and smiled at me, helplessly, apologetically. The curtains just wouldn't fall right. Then the doorbell rang. A shadow scurried across her face, found her lips, parted them against a new terror. It was Dr. Sensky. I told him what happened. He went over to her, took her hand, spoke quietly to her, and the shadow darted back inside her. There were things to check. The apartment across the court, for instance, from which the man had watched her. The apartment was empty, hadn't been occupied for a week. Its door opened so that people could wander in, look at it, stare through its window. And then back to headquarters, and Detective Muggerman handing me a slip of paper. On it, the address of Elizabeth Webster, divorced wife of the murdered man. I went there. She thought I should have come at another time. You see, you shouldn't just burst in on a girl like this. Not even if you are from the police. A girl must have time to prepare herself, to make herself presentable, attractive. I just want to talk to you about your husband, Ms. Webster. My late husband. My divorced husband. He was murdered. Good for him. Now, if you'll just sit over there and watch me freshen up my face, I'll tell you anything you want to know. All you have to do is be sweet about it. When were you divorced? On October 17th at 1.35 in the p.m. in the year of our Lord, 1941. Nine years ago. Nine years without John. I'm just lucky, I guess. Watch me, Mr. Clover. I always start my makeup from the mouth. Why? Because it makes me more attractive. More, uh, you know, to boys like you. I meant, why did you divorce him? Oh, well, that to that. Look what you made me do. You made me smear my lipstick. You haven't answered me. You want to know why? Because he never loved me. Because even on our honeymoon, I woke up one night and I, I found him looking at me and, and calling me Agnes. Agnes. I slapped him hard, you bet. Good and hard. He never thought of me as Agnes again. Not to my face, you bet. Agnes Harper? Agnes Harper. John's other girlfriend. John's other wife. Except he never married her. He married me. Look what it's got. When did you see him last? October 17, 135 in the p.m., the year of our Lord, 1941, the day we were divorced. Goodbye, Mr. Clover. Oh, hello. I see you're back again. That's right, Mr. Perry. See all the lonely hearts have gone home. Uh -huh. They come here, meet people, go home to think about it. And that leaves just you. Tell me something, Danny. Am I a murder suspect? That's right. You are. I told you I never met the man. But Agnes did. Are you going to talk to me, Mr. Perry, or are you going to phone your lawyer and say you're going to jail to please hurry up and meet you there because you're being held for suspicion of felony, felony being murder? Which, Mr. Perry? Then all the lonely hearts would lose faith in old Tom Perry, wouldn't they? Let's face it. Sit down, Danny. You want to know why I never married Agnes? If that's where you want to start. 
Why I didn't marry her was this. There was something there, Danny. I can't tell you what. The setup was... Well, it wasn't nice. Agnes, her sister. And then there's the other thing. What other thing? Agnes... And here's where old John Webster comes in. Agnes was going to marry him. Didn't. At the last minute, she didn't. Left the boy standing there right at the altar with egg in his face. That's what I want to know about. What happened? Agnes didn't tell me exactly. Just didn't show up for the wedding. Something happened, something important, I guess, because Agnes didn't show up. You want to know something else? You'll tell me, huh? When Agnes and I were going to get married, well, I have a friend that does weddings at a pretty nice rate for friends, but Agnes wanted to use the same justice of peace. Who? Name's Harrison Ingersoll. Anything there, Danny? I wouldn't know. But I'll find out. Thanks, old Tom. Mr. Clover. Did the marriage go well, Harrison? Yeah, wait well, till I look in this envelope, then I'll tell you, Martha. Ten. Ten dollars. Didn't go as well as we'd counted on, did it, Harrison? Martha. Oh, don't worry about him, Harrison. He's only a policeman. Nothing to him but a lot of questions. Right, Mr. Clover? Please, Martha. <laughs> Ask away, young man. Ask and you shall receive it. About Agnes Harper, hey, I wonder. Hey, I told you, Harrison. I told you someone would come snooping around here before long. I told you. Uh, so you did, Martha. I told you. Yes, Martha. Uh, what is it about Agnes Harper, Mr. Clover? A suicide? I know nothing of it. Save what I read in the paper. That's all we know, Harrison and I. All. You were going to perform the wedding ceremony for her, for her and John Webster. It didn't come off. Can you tell me why? Agnes was a friend of ours. I don't feel it. Nonsense, to... Harrison. If you won't tell him, I will. I won't have our lives messed up by these snoopers. Why didn't they get married, Miss Ingersoll? Because just the night before Agnes was to be married, someone tried to kill her. Murder her. Anyhow, that's the whispers that went around. Anyhow, Harrison didn't marry them. Who tried to kill her? I tried to find out, but I couldn't. He hushed up. Don't look at me like that, Harrison. The man asked, so I told him. You're too loyal, Harrison. Goodbye, Miss Clover. Oh, hello, Mr. Clover. I'm glad you came back. I knew you'd want to know I was feeling just... Fine. Please come in. Thanks. Yes, uh, Dr. Stacy is a very gentle man. Yes, yes. Hi, it's a lovely Indian summer night. Come out on the terrace and look at it with me. All right. Oh, my. It's beautiful, isn't it? Agnes would have enjoyed a night like this. Yes. Yes, she would. How would you know? From what you've told me about her, from what other people have told me. What other people? Thomas Perry. What did he tell you? He said he didn't marry your sister because he was afraid. Afraid? What did he have to be afraid of? I don't know. What does he know about being afraid? But you know, don't you, Miss Hopper? What? Tell me, who tried to kill your sister the night before she was to marry John Webster? You said I knew about being afraid. You are right now this minute, because your sister is gone from you forever. Agnes is dead, you know. My sister is dead. Finally succeeded in killing her, didn't she? I do very well without her. I can do things for myself. When she was going to marry John Webster, you tried to kill her, but... No, it was someone else. It was you, Miss Hartley. Well, what difference does it make? She didn't hurt herself. Besides, she didn't want John Webster anyhow. He told me so. The whole day of the wedding, we sat together, and she told me over and over again how wrong she'd been. It was different with Thomas Perry. This time she knew she wasn't wrong, so you killed her, pushed her out of the kitchen window. Watched her fall. Watched her fall. Now you're alone. Even if she wasn't going to marry Tom Perry, she was going to leave me. She told me that, too. Stabbed John Webster because he knew you'd killed your sister. He knew you'd try to do it once before. You didn't think I could do things like that, did you? None of you know the things I can do. Aren't you afraid when you hung yourself? Afraid I might come too late? I'm clever. 
I waited till you knocked on the door. The thing you people don't know. You'll need a coat, Miss Harper. Let's get it. No. The thing you people don't know, I'm going to watch you for. Watch you for. She ah! lunged at me through the ah! weight of the frail body against me. Her face leaned ah! close to mine, and the sounds she made. Ah! I took her arm, held them close to her side, and watched her. Ah! Sanity fled from her, and it melted into the darkness of the night. Broadway screaming now. It smears and makes a big fist of the night. And the carnival is boiling. And it's the clown and the -the jack-in-the-box that leap from dark doorways. And it's the geek with no arms, no legs, and no heart. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesome mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Jeanette Nolan, Peggy Weber, Marjorie Bennett, Francis X. Bushman, Ted Osborne, and Stan Waxman. Mm-hmm.